Okay, this is going to be chapter two, uh, anatomy physiology, and this is going to be discussing matter, atoms, and molecules. Um, matter, atoms, and molecules. In this area, we'll talk about the structure of an atom, chemical bonds, and chemical compounds. Um, <clears throat> uh, chemistry uh, is the science that investigates uh, matter and its interactions. Uh, matter is anything that takes up space or makes mass. Uh, elements, all matter is composed of elements. Elements cannot be broken down any further. And then an atom is the smallest stable unit of material. All of these are terms and need to be known for the test. Uh, so uh, just to go over it again, breaking it down a little bit more. Uh, chemistry is about the science of chemicals, correct? matter and its interactions. So examples H2O, the study of that, the study of hydrogen and so on. And then matter is anything that would take up space. So anything that would occupy any type of space, no matter how small it is, is considered matter. Uh, elements are pretty much this, uh, broken down about as far as they can go. Example of this, uh, if you had H2O, which was water, and you broke it down to its smallest elements, you would have hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and the atom itself, which would be a, um, a hydrogen atom, is the smallest stable unit of material. Um, the structure of an atom. Uh, whenever we're looking at the actual atoms themselves, we have protons, which are positively charged. So protons, positively charged. Neutrons are a neutral charge and electrons are a negative charge. Now when we look at the atomic number is the number of protons in an atom. Uh, the nucleus, proton located in the center of the atom. Um, electron clouds are pretty much shells that orbit the nucleus and we'll be talking about all these in pretty much detail. And the electron shell, uh, electron cloud, spherical representation, of where the electrons would be going outside of the actual atom or, or in its shells. Uh, so again, one more time, quick review. Protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral. Electrons are negative. Atomic number is the amount of protons. You might see a test question on that. Uh, nucleus, protons located, which inside the nucleus is where the protons are located. The electron cloud, uh, electrons that orbit the nucleus and then the electron shell and we're going to notice here in a couple more slides that there are multiple shells as we start looking at them uh... and this is a diagram of atomic structure and if we'll take a look here really quick um, this right here is the electron shell this big circle around the outside this is a helium atom and helium is is uh is two on the atomic number and that's because it has two protons inside of it. It also has two neutrons and also two electrons. And something else we'll learn here in just a few minutes is that this first shell always will have, there's only one example that is not like this, but for the most part if we're talking about an atom and we're talking about the electrons in it, there is always two in that first shell. Two electrons. They're always going to be in that first shell. Now the only person that stands outside that's not like this is hydrogen. We have a hydrogen molecule here. Hydrogen is one in the atomic number and has one electron in the outer shell. Uh, electron clouds. Um, this is a uh, like space filling model here. This right here is uh, electron shell model and what this does is it allows us to see why things would stick together. Example, if we filled this out and turn this one here into an oxygen um, molecule, then whenever looking at the actual if and then this was a hydrogen molecule and this was an oxygen molecule we could tell you why 
that hydrogen and oxygen want to stick together? And the answer is, is they share their outer electron shells. Uh, isotopes, 1.5. Isotopes um, pretty much have more protons than neutrons. Um, mass number of something is the total number of protons and neutrons in the, nu in the nucleus. So whenever we look at the mass number of things, it's the total number of protons which are inside the nucleus and the total number of neutrons which are inside the nucleus added together. Atomic weight. Atomic weight takes into account the mass of subatomic particles and the relative proportions of any isotopes. This is a periodic table of the elements. If we'll notice up here that this right here is hydrogen. And we were also looking at helium, which was H2, H2. Example, hydrogen. This is going to be the nucleus. Hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. It also has it sh has one proton inside the nucleus, which I'm going to draw over here. It should have one proton and one neutron inside that nucleus. And then in the outer shell, it has one electron. Another example as we go through this. I'm going to erase the screen here really quick. It is going to be helium. Since helium's atomic number is 2, it has 2 protons on the inside and 2 neutrons. If you will look at its atomic weight, which is 4, that's because we have 2 protons, 2 neutrons, and it takes into consideration inside the nucleus that 2 plus 2 is 4. Also, it will have 2 electrons in the outer shell. Alright, as far as the electron shells go, the first shell fills up with two electrons. The second shell can take up to eight electrons. Inert gases are pretty much stable atoms, and I'll show you why here in just a second. Okay, so back to this, and I'm going to clear my drawing here. All right, so let's find oxygen. Oxygen is eight, and I'm going to draw an O. And then this right here is its nucleus on oxygen. So it has eight. So the shell configuration for oxygen would be for the following. The first shell has two in it, all except for hydrogen. After that, we make up the rest of eight. So what I generally do is whenever I'm drawing these out, I'll do something like this. Now that outer shell there can take up to eight, but in oxygen's case, it has two openings. Now the easiest way we can fill those openings, an example, would be the sharing of an electron with a hydrogen molecule. And here, hydrogen molecule. And it shared those electrons since hydrogen only has one in its outer shell. The oxygen has two open spots. Together, this is H2O. So again, the first shell fills up with two electrons. The second shell can take up to eight electrons. Inert gases are stable atoms. Back to the inert gases. The reason an inert gas, there we go, I want to erase this again, is a stable atom, and that's, this is all of these here. Example would be helium. Well, helium has the, sh the first shell, only one shell, and it's filled. 
with two atoms because the electron number in helium or the atomic number is two. Another example, neon. It has ten in it, so that means the first shell takes two. After that, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Neon also is stable because the outer electron shell is filled. All right, electron shells. So this is kind of a review of what we just did. Um, the first electron shell will have two atoms in it. After that, we can have up to eight. If you'll do a quick count on these. There's eight of them, which are electrons. Neon atom, and they just did neon on this one. A neon atom has 10 protons, 10 neutrons, and 10 electrons. Well, the first two fill up, and then there's eight in the outer shell, which makes it stable. The carbon atom, which has some room for attachment, has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Its atomic number, carbon, so atomic number should be six. And we can go back to the periodic table of the elements here and show you sorry, some things that carbon its atomic number is six. If we'll also look down there at the atomic weight of carbon, which is twelve. That's because it has six protons six neutrons. That's the inner atomic weight inside of the nucleus. It has also six electrons. That means the first two one, two, three, four, five, six. Now it can be written like this or to where there's two openings. Uh, generally speaking, CO2 CO2 oxygen has eight so that means that there's two oxygen molecules in CO2 and they'll pretty much bind up there. There's still some room for, for opening there on CO2. Alright so again carbon atom first shell is two after that it can hold up to eight but we're only going to make up six so one, two, three, four, Five, six. Uh, chemical bonds and chemical compounds. Chemical bonds hold participating atoms together. And that's what we've been talking about here a little bit. Uh, molecules, chemical structures that contain more than one atom. Uh, compounds, chemical structure made up of two or more elements. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, an ionic bond, a cation has a positively charged particle. Example of this is going to be sodium. Sodium, whenever we notice it here later on and we start talking about it in physiology, is a positively charged cation. An anion, a negatively charged ion, which would be something like hydroxide or chloride. Ionic bonds, chemical bonds created by electrical attractions between anions and cations. An uh, example of an ionic compound of salt is sodium chloride. And the reason that they stick together, if we want to take a look at this, is because the opposites attract. An uh, example of this, this is figure 2,4b in your book. Uh, formation of ions. This is a sodium ion, which has an extra one and just one in its outer shell and this is a chloride atom uh, which has an open spot for one so the opposites attract they share this electron in their outer shell which is this right here and it they come together and form an ionic compound
the, the sodium being positively charged, the chloride being negatively charged. Covalent bonds. A covalent bond bound together by filling up the outer electron shell. That's what we were just talking about. A single covalent bond, the sharing of one pair of electrons, and a double covalent bond, the sharing of two pairs of electrons. Uh, example, hydrogen, H2, versus oxygen, which this is sharing how many pairs of electrons? Two pairs. And this is a 2 here. Instead of just O2, this is CO2, which we're sharing two two pair of electrons. Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bond is, is slightly positive and oxygen is slightly negative. They attract to one another pretty much. So opposites attract. Uh, surface tension. Due to the way the hydrogen bonds and the way that water bonds, um, it provides a little bit of surface tension. So it holds things together just, just from its interaction between one another. The surface tension acts as a barrier and small keeps pretty much small objects from entering it. And an example of this is pretty much going to be a bug on a water. If you've ever seen a bug walk across the water, the reason it can walk across the water is, one, it doesn't have much weight. And the surface tension is high enough to where there's enough tension there to where it can literally walk on the water. And this is a picture, figure 2.6 of hydrogen bonding. The oxygen and the hydrogen, they kind of bond together because they're just H2O. But since there you have a, a polar bonding here, or a hydrogen bonding, the positive and the negative, this provides surface tension, and this surface tension, if the if you don't weigh too much, will allow you to walk right across the water. Chemical notation. Uh, chemical notation is pretty much chemical shorthand. Uh, this is on table 2-3. If you want to take a look at it, examples of chemical notation are going to be H would be indication of a hydrogen molecule. Two H's would be two hydrogen molecules. Um, so as we start notating things, examples are H2O, um, there would be two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule, and so on. So please look at table 2-3 so that you're familiar with the way the chemicals are noted. Uh, chemical reactions. <clears throat> We're going to talk about basic energy concepts, uh, types of reactions, enzymes, and chemical reactions in general. Uh, chemical reactions. Chemical reactions. A new chemical bond forms between atoms or existing bonds between atoms are broken. And we're going to talk about anabolism and catabolism and all kinds of things here. So chemical reaction. Either it breaks things down or builds things up. Reactants. Uh, substance arranged to create another su uh, substance. So if I got part A and part B and I have a specific type of reaction, I can get actually get a part AB out of this. Uh, products, items formed from the reactants, uh, metabolism, chemical reactions in the body. And again, uh, there's a lot of terms in this chapter. Please know those terms pretty well. Basic energy concepts. Uh, work, movement or change in physical structure or matter is the definition of work. And then we have energy, which is the capacity to perform work. And there's two types of energy that we like to look at. We have kinetic energy, which is essentially energy in motion. And we're going to talk about a traumatic energy formula here in just a second. And then we have potential energy, which is essentially stored energy. So we'll be talking about all kinds of potentials, action potentials, depolarization waves later on. So the cell would store energy until it reaches something called a threshold. And we're going to talk all about that in uh, sodium potassium pump, cell movement, and so on. So at this point, you have two types of energy, kinetic and potential. Um, clinical note, kinetic energy and, 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 and injury. Kinetic energy is the energy contained by a body in motion. Uh, kinetic energy of an object is directly proportional to the square of its speed. Now, whenever you're figuring a square of something, you multiply it by itself. So you can have in this formula here, the mass at some point becomes irrelevant if the speed becomes exponential. And let me give you an example of this. 
if you have someone that weighs 10 kilograms, which isn't very much, and he's traveling at 60 miles per hour, <clears throat> that isn't going to be near as bad as if he's traveling 120 miles per hour. The kinetic energy units that would be delivered on this object would exponentially multiply depending on how much velocity that the actual object had. Types of reactions. Three types of reactions. We have decomposition, synthesis, and exchange. And the first one we're going to talk about here is decomposition reactions. And decomposition reaction breaks a molecule into smaller fragments. And an example of this is going to be digestion. If you eat a piece of broccoli, the broccoli goes into your intestine. <clears throat> the broccoli itself, you have iron and vitamins and all kinds of nutrients in the broccoli. But whenever the broccoli went in, it was essentially AB. It wasn't until it hit your physiological environment that your body broke down the broccoli. And then you get, I got 10 parts of A and 12 parts of B and maybe some parts of C out of this. So example of this, so digestion is going to break it down into smaller molecules and fragments that they can actually use. <clears throat> Next one is hydrolysis. Now, if we'll break down the word hydro, which means water, and lice, which means break apart. So one of the bonds in a complex molecule is broken down, and the components of a water molecule is added to the resulting fragments. Now, we're going to see a multitude of reactions in the body that are broken down by hydrolysis. So if we add water to these chemical reactions, what happens is, is I'm going to get a part A and a part B out of this. Example, if everyone will take a look at this area right here. <clears throat> a, B, C, and D, and E plus water is going to equal A, B, and C plus, or A, B, C, and H plus H, O, and D, and E. If you'll notice, A, B, C, D, and E were all together in its own nice little complex molecular compound. When we added water, it broke it down into equal parts, part A and part B. And catabolism refers to the decomposition reaction or the breakdown. Again, decomposition reactions. Synthesis reactions. <clears throat> Synthesis reaction, opposite of a decomposition reaction, uh, assembles large molecules from smaller ones. <clears throat> so if we had A and B, we're going to get essentially AB out of this. Uh, dehydration synthesis or condensation formation of a complex molecule by the removal of water and whenever we look at sugars and fats and all kinds of things to where we add things to them example of this in the liver we have a polysaccharide in the liver which means a very large lengthy sugar molecule how the sugar molecule gets together is through dehydration synthesis. So we pull water off of it and one C6H12O6 molecule gets stuck to another C6H12O6 molecule and so on and so on and so on. Uh, dehydration synthesis, uh, pardon me, synthesis again. Example, if we'll look right here, A, B, C, and H plus H, O, D, and E, and if you'll we'll look right here, this is your water molecule. And then all of a sudden, we dehydrate it or pull the water off, and we get A, B, C, D, and E. So by the dehydration of this molecule that was in two parts, I have synthesized it together and made one larger molecule. Anabolism is the synthesis of new compounds in the body or building up. <clears throat> <coughs> exchange reactions. Uh, exchange reactions, a part of the reacting molecule, are shuffled around. So if we want to take a look at this, and we're going to see these as well in the body. AB plus CD will yield AD plus CB. It kind of flips it around. Um, in real world application, uh, you have an enzyme in your body called carbonic anhydrase and it is actually located on a red blood cell. Now what this enzyme does for us is it causes an enzymatic chemical reaction 
So it takes carbonic acid, which is this right here, H2CO3, and we'll break it down into H2O plus CO2. Or it will take H2O and CO2 and make H2CO3. So this is an exchange reaction. It goes both ways. Or this is also an example of a reversible reaction. We'll talk about it both types. Um, the one example I just gave back also could work as a reversible reaction. H2O plus CO2 could be turned into carbonic acid, and carbonic acid could be turned into H2O plus CO2. Um, example of this is, and the most important thing about a reversible reaction is, is that it essentially goes both ways. Uh, enzymes and chemical reactions. Um, enzymes are e cheap and easy for the body, and I'll explain that a little bit further here in the next slide or two. Uh, activation energy is the amount of energy to start a reaction. So sometimes this can be pretty costly for the cellular environment. <coughs> enzymes are a catalyst that speeds up a reaction. So if you have an enzyme in place, it, it does a chemical job on part A and part B and gives you a product and a product that didn't cost you as much. Uh, a catalyst, a compound that accelerates chemical reactions without themselves being permanently changed. So the nice thing about this enzyme is it gives us a lot of bang for our buck. It's easy. It doesn't require a lot of energy. We get an immediate result from this, and it can happen again and again and again because the enzyme is still around. Now, the key point of enzyme is the amount of activation energy that it requires. And if everyone will take a look at this area here. Without an enzyme, we have a large amount of activation energy. And with an enzyme, we have a very small amount of activation energy. Now, here's the point of this. With the use of enzymes, then the reason the body uses enzymes is it's free money. That when you have enzymatic action, it's very easy for you to make chemical reactions without costing or putting yourself into cellular bankruptcy. Inorganic compounds. Uh, we're going to talk about carbon dioxide and oxygen, water and its properties, inorganic acids and bases, and salts. Um, inorganic compounds, nutrients, uh, are essential elements and molecules that are obtained from the diet. And that should make pretty much sense, just like it is. <clears throat> that if you do not have the appropriate nutrients, you will pretty much go into some sort of malnutrition. Uh, or poor nutrition. Uh, metabolites. All molecules synthesized or broken down by chemical reactions inside our bodies and these would be anything. So if we need protein molecules or fat molecules or water molecules or what have you, they're all considered metabolites. Inorganic compounds. Small molecules that do not contain, again, there's some questions on this, not only in your homework but also in the test, Inorganic compounds are small molecules that do not contain carbon and hydrogen. Organic compounds, that is what they're made of, is carbon and hydrogen. So again, inorganic compounds, they do not contain carbon and hydrogen. Organic compounds are primarily composed of carbon and hydrogen. Carbon dioxide and oxygen. The cells produce carbon dioxide. Now, we kind of know that, right? We breathe in oxygen. We load oxygen at the cellular level. The cell's metabolism themselves produces carbon dioxide, and then we breathe it off on the return exchange. Oxygen is an atmospheric gas absorbed by the lungs and transported in the blood and consumed by the cellular environment. And CO2 is the off gas that is expelled from the cellular environment. Water and its properties. A single most important constituent in the body. Three unique properties due to the hydrogen bonding in water. One, water is an excellent solvent. It dissolves a remarkable variety of inorganic and organic compounds. Water has a very high heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to heat water, 
resulting in result is body temperature is stabilized. So we're mostly made of water and fat. We're mostly made of water and fat. <clears throat> and then last but not least, water is an excellent reactant. Dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So again, a quick review of what we just said in the previous slides, that in dehydration synthesis, by pulling out a water molecule, we add to smaller molecules together to make a larger molecule. And then if we want those larger molecules apart into parts A and parts B again, we add water to it. Solutions. Uh, solutions, a uniform mixture of solvent and dissolved sol solutes. <clears throat> and getting comfortable with these two terms right now is going to be a godsend whenever we start talking about fluid dynamics and electrolytes and all that. A solvent is the actual fluid. Uh, a solute are the solid parts that are in the solution. <clears throat> so a solution is a uniform mixture of solvent of water, essentially, and dissolved solutes. <clears throat> Ionization. Disassociation in a solution. Ionic bonds are broken down <clears throat> and individual ions interact with the positive or negative end. Proteins only work in a solution. So all of the proteins in our body would only work because they're actually in a solution. So as we look at this, whenever we put this is a water molecule here. It's got a negative pole and a positive pole. And that's this guy here. And this is a chloride ion right here. And this is a sodium ion. So guess what this was to start with? It was sodium chloride. And whenever we placed it into water, what happened was is it disassociated. So the sodium broke apart and the chloride broke, broke apart and the water kind of surrounded it. An ionized salt will disassociate in water. Inorganic acids and bases. Acids. Any substance that breaks apart in a solution to release hydrogen. An example of this is going to be hydrochloric acid. Um, a base is a substance that removes hydrogen ions from a solution. And the example of this is hydroxide, or OH negative, right here. And if it removes hydrogen, what do we have there? And the answer is, is we have water, H2O. Hydrogen ions and pH. <clears throat> pH is hydrogen ion concentration in the blood or other bodily fluids. A neutral pH, and we're talking completely neutral, not where the body lives at, but completely neutral, is 7.0, and that's the pH of distilled water. 7.1, just a little bit on the other side of that, is a very basey or alkali substance. That's 7.1. And then if we are 6.9, we are acidic. So again, a 7.1 basic, a 6.9 acidic. Neutral pH is 7.0. Buffers and pH. Buffers are compounds that stabilize pH by either removing or replacing hydrogen ions. Example of this is going to be sodium bicarbonate. Sodium and whenever we break off the sodium we get a bicarbonate ion. This is also the bicarbonate buffer system. What it does is it picks up an extra hydrogen molecule. This is no longer bicarbonate. This is carbonic acid. Now the carbonic acid, due to carbonic anhydrase, can be broken down into H2O plus CO2. Now, if we did give it in the form of sodium bicarbonate, what happens is the sodium breaks off and goes to the kidneys, the water follows, we hyperventilate the patient, and blow off the CO2. And we have eliminated the acid. 
pH and hydrogen ion concentration. Again, neutral. If we're headed this way into the higher numbering, it's very basey. If we're headed this way, we're becoming more acidic. Stomach acid or hydrochloric acid is extremely acidic. It's got a pH of about 1 to 2. Uh, we reside about right here. Our normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45, and that would be a good number to start remembering now. This means we're a little on the basey side. However, we can only survive with very little margin of error on this on these numbers right here. If we're ever one point out in either direction, it is unsurvivable. Example, I have never seen a person that is 6.35 survive. Clinical note, understanding pH. And pH kind of works in, in reverse. Most people would think the higher the number, the more acidic something is. That is not the way the pH works. It's a logarithmic value, and it works in reverse of what you might think. So an acid, a very, very high acid level, is something with a pH of 2.0. And if you are very, very, very alkalotic, you have a pH of about 9.0. Now, two things occur to the cellular environment whenever it's like this. If you throw an egg into a vat of hydrochloric acid, what do you think is going to happen to the egg? And the answer is, is it's going to fry the egg. So this right here is going to cause necrosis and destruction to tissue. A pH of 9.0, most of y'all unfortunately have had the experience with something similar to this. The question that generally comes to mind is how did grandma or your grandma or maybe your great grandma ever make lye soap? And the answer is, is she took fat renderings and mixed it with lye. And now lye has a pH of about 14, give or take. We can go back and take a look at this. I think, oh, we don't think we have lye in here. But it should be at a pH way over here in about this range here. So has about a pH of 14. Now what that does is it causes saponification of fat. Most of the cells in your body are of a phospholipid bilayer, which means they're mostly made of fat. So if anybody has ever gotten their hands into bleach or ammonia or easy off oven cleaner, you'll notice as you get your hands out of that, that your hands feel very, very slick. And the reason that is, is because the pH of that solution is causing soponification to your skin. So pH is of 9.0. Soponification. Three point eleven salt. Salt is an ionic compound that consists of any cation, positively charged particle, except a hydrogen ion, and any anion, a negatively charged particle, except hydroxide, and they're held together by an ionic bond. And in water, they disassociate. Electrolytes, examples of salts, inorganic compounds whose ions cannot conduct electrical current in a solution. Example of those electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. Organic compounds. We have a very large amount of organic compounds. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acid, and then high energy compounds. As we talk about these, sugars, fats, proteins, DNA, RNA, and then ATP. Organic compounds uh, always contain four elements, carbon and hydrogen, and generally oxygen as well. Four major classes of large organic molecules are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Carbohydrates, organic molecule that contains a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a ratio near 1 to 1. An example of this, oh, sorry, C6, H12, O6. Now that is the chemical equation for glucose, and glucose is a carbohydrate. 1, 2, 1. 
there are three types. There are monosaccharides, which are one molecule. There are disaccharides, which are two molecules. And then there are polysaccharides, which are many, 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 many molecules. Monosaccharides, simple sugar. Glucose, the most important metabolic fuel in the body. Distributed by the blood and the bodily fluids. Monosaccharide, glucose. This is an example of glucose. If we count them all up, this is C6H12O6. Disaccharides and polysaccharides. Disaccharides meaning two monosaccharides joined together. Polysaccharides meaning many resulting from repeated dehydration synthesis. Again, so how did they get together? How did they get two gigant molecules together? They form them together through dehydration synthesis. And then we have glycogen, chain of sugar molecules stored in the liver. And glycogen is our number one polysaccharide. The polysaccharide is stored in the liver, so whenever we need sugar, we have a release of a hormone from the pancreas. This breaks apart the sugar chains, or the glycogen in the liver, and gives us active sugar that's available to our body. And quick going over this, complex sugars and glycogen. If we have a glucose and a fructose, which are both isomers of sugar, and what an isomer means is it is all C6H12O6. We have two isomers of glucose. We have dehydration synthesis occur, and now we have a new form element called sucrose. If we want it apart, if we want the sucrose apart, the easiest way is to break it apart by hydrolysis. We're going to add the water and it breaks it back down into glucose and fructose. Lipids. Lipids are fat containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're insoluble in water. If you don't believe me, you can pour some oil on top of water. Uh, special transport me mechanisms to transport them in the blood uh, form essential structural components of all cells, important energy reserves. Uh, major types of lipids are fatty acids, fats, steroids, and phospholipids. Fatty acid, long chains of carbon atoms with an attached hydro hydrogen or a COOH carboxyl group. And we're going to hear that word carboxyl again. Anything with a COOH is considered to have a carboxyl group. Saturated, a fatty acid containing no double bonds, and this means that it is pretty much high energy. And then an unsaturated, a fatty acid containing a double bond, which means it has a lower amount of energy. Monounsaturated, at least one double bond. Polyunsaturated, multiple double bonds. Poly meaning multiple or many. And this is a saturated fat. And this is an unsaturated fat. And one of the things we'll see is the saturated fats are pretty much a solid at room temperature. An example of this is going to be butter. Unsaturated fats. An example of this may be corn oil. Fats. Fats cannot string together like sugars. Uh, can be attached to a glycerol. Uh, glycerol is the backbone of all lipids. <clears throat> a fat is a wide group of compounds that are triglycerides, uh, triesters of glycerol, and any of several fatty acids. A triglyceride is a glycerol molecule attached to three fatty acids. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats are a liquid at room temperature. And again, this is done through dehydration synthesis. So if you'll pay attention here, this is one fatty acid a different fatty acid, and yet a different fatty acid. We essentially take out the water or make it combine by dehydration synthesis and whenever we pull out that water we attach these three together which now we have a triglyceride. If we wanted this apart, this is a reversible reaction. By hydrolysis or adding water we break it down into a glycerol and three fatty acids. 4.12 steroids. 
Steroids are large lipid molecules composed of four connected rings of carbon atoms. <clears throat> cholesterol is the best known steroid. A cell membrane contains cholesterol. Hormones are derived from cholesterol. An example of those hormones are going to be testosterone and estrogen are all cholesterol based. And this is what Mr. Cholesterol looks like. <clears throat> Uh, phospholipids <clears throat> consists of a glycerol and two fatty acids linked to a non-lipid group by a phosphate group. The non-lipid portion is soluble in water, which means that it likes water, hydrophilic, and the fatty acid portion is relatively insoluble in water, which means it doesn't like water, which is hydrophobic. Now we're going to see this whenever we start talking about cellular environment, that we have hydrophilic one part to this phospholipid bilayer and a hydrophobic another part to this phospholipid bilayer. So you need to know these two words, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilic, I like water. Hydrophobic, I don't. And this is a phospholipid. Again, we can see our glycerol backbone here. Proteins. Proteins are biochemical compounds consist of one or more polypeptides typically folded into a globular or fibrous form, <clears throat> facilitating a biological function. The most abundant organic compound in the human body, 20% of all your total body weight, <clears throat> and they pretty much determine your cell shape, and they determine your tissue properties. A cell's function is performed by proteins. All proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. <clears throat> protein function. Um, they pretty much are support, movement, transport, buffering, and metabolic regulation in the body. As far as support goes, creates a three-dimensional framework for the body. That's how they work in support. <clears throat> movement. Contractile proteins are responsible for muscular contractions. Uh, transport. Insoluble lipids, respiratory gases, and mineral hormones. All done by proteins. Buffering. Correct pH changes in cells and tissues. And we're going to see later on that we have three types of buffering systems. <coughs> Pardon me. We have uh, the bicarbonate buffering system, the respiratory buffering system, and the protein buffering system. We even have one more called the phosphate. But for the most part, the protein buffering system works in the intracellular environment. And the respiratory or bicarbonate buffer system kind of works systemically throughout the body. Um, and then metabolic regulation. We're going to see enzymes that are primarily composed of proteins that accelerate chemical reactions in living cells. Protein function continued. Coordination, communication, and control hormones influence the metabolic activities of every cell. And we're going to see hormones that travel right across the cellular membranes. They go right in. Proteins are activated and they turn about and do completely different commands that these proteins tell them. <clears throat> Defense. Tough waterproof proteins of the skin, hair and nails, antibodies, special clotting proteins, restrict bleeding after an injury. So all of your clotting factors, your ability to clot or, or stop bleeding, all of your antibodies that work in your immune system, your skin, your hair, your nails, all made of very tough fibrous proteins. Um, and it's what allows your skin to kind of be waterproof. And that's a good thing. You don't want to flood the, your, your area there of your intercellular tissue. Now, the question is, is what is this? And this has a... Anything that has a pattern like this, or similar to this, is considered a protein. Now this here is a hormone, the, or the chemical equation of a hormone, and it just so happens to be epinephrine that we're looking at. And it is kind of a hormone. We have a synthetic version of this that we carry on the truck. This hormone is a protein by nature, or by structure. Um, the next thing is, what is this? This is a 3D molecule of something. And the answer is, is it's a 3D molecule of prothrombin. Now, prothrombin 
has it it assists in the making of clots in the body and we'll talk more about detail about prothrombin thrombin fibrin polymers and all kinds of stuff later on whenever we start talking about the blood uh, protein structure amino acids long chains of organic molecules anything with the pattern of NH2COOH and that's what I drew up there just a second ago it's an amine with a carboxyl group a peptide bond amino acids are strung together like beads carbolic carboxylic acid group of one attached to the other peptides are molecules made up of amino acids held together by peptide bonds two dipeptide poly meaning many peptide bonds and then denature denaturation is high body temperatures alter the shape of a protein now this brings into play what would happen during an event where someone would have a very high fever for a long period of time or even pH changes will adjust this as well the proteins themselves will denature your cellular environment runs off of proteins you will essentially de destroy yourself from the inside out if you have an adjusted pH that is in the acidic area or if it's a really extreme alkalotic area or if you have a high body temperature once your cells get to a certain temperature the proteins themselves start to denature all right and this is structure of an amino acid as long as they still we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail later but as long as they have this basic structure <clears throat> they are considered a protein more protein structures myoglobin hemoglobin keratin fiber which is hair and nails everyone knows what hemoglobin is is what carries your oxygen on your red blood cell <clears throat> enzyme function most important protein is an enzyme a substrate reacts reactants of an enzyme <clears throat> a product the result of an enzymatic action or reaction and then an active site a special area that allows the enzyme to attach and make the product now enzymes are awesome because they're running around the body it's the active site so if it sees part A and part B and both of them go in whenever this enzyme is done with them it's like a pop tart Bing! you have a new product so again substrates enzyme these little things here are the active sites substrate enzyme action and then your product all with little or no energy nucleic acid and these are the DNAs um, large organic molecules composed of carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and phosphorus you have a couple different types that we're going to talk about and more in detail later uh, deoxyribonucleic acid you have four nitrogen bases adenine guanine cytosine and thiamine and then you have ribonucleic acid now we have two types of RNA or ribonucleic acid we have tRNA and mRNA and we're going to talk about later on translation of DNA but the ribonucleic acid has the same protein pairs as the DNA except for one it's minus the thiamine the thiamine is replaced by uracil whenever we're looking at the ribonucleic acids and this is both in the tRNA the transfer RNA and the messenger RNA <clears throat> uh, base pair rules so this up top here this is DNA so A pairs with T and you're going to need to look over this G pairs with C C pairs with G and T pairs with A and this is in DNA now here's where it gets a little confusing sometimes this is DNA to RNA A pairs with uracil guanine pairs with cytosine cytosine pairs with guanine 
thymine pairs with um, arginine. I think so. Sorry. Yeah, adenine. When the two molecules of RNA pair, the rules are, and I'll just go ADU on this one to quicken it up here. ADU, guanine to cytosine, or C to G, U to A. Now, you're going to have to play with this a couple, two or three times before you can get these pairs to pair up. There is some worksheets in Chapter 2 that are going to be on the uh, Blackboard site. So please do those. Uh, again, this is a DNA codon or a section A to T, T to A, G to C, C to G, T to A, A to T, C to G, G to C, A to T, T to A. G to C, C to G, and so on. DNA is going to be the building blocks of your entire body. Uh, genes to proteins, whenever it's going in. This is where the uracil, adenine, adenine, thiamine. This is on the DNA side. This would be your messenger RNA right here. We'll talk about this more in detail later. All right, high energy compounds, which are essentially adenosine triphosphate or ATP. <clears throat> Enzymatic action within the cells create compounds derived from nucle nucleotides and building blocks of nucleic acid. The most important of them are pretty much adenosine triphosphate. Every cell in your body runs off of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Matter of fact, it breaks off these phosphate bonds and uses them for cellular energy, composed of adenosine monophosphate and two phosphate groups. Now, this is very simple. AMP, adenosine monophosphate, gets a phosphate group added to it. It turns into adenosine diphosphate. It gets another phosphate group added to it, and it turns into adenosine triphosphate. So what we're going to see in this energy building thing is we're going to see continuously ADP going from ADP to ATP in a cyclic circle. Uh, energy flow and recycling of ATP. So if everyone want to pay attention here for just a second, take a look at this. This is adenosine diphosphate. We added a phosphate to it. It was di, which means two. Then it turns into ATP, energy release for cellular activities, which burn off the phosphate group. You go back to ADP, another protein's added to it, phosphate group comes in, ATP, self-perpetuating circle again and again and again. Uh, so a quick overview of the organic compounds. Again, by the list, organic compounds, carbohydrates, which are sugars, lipids, which are fats. We have triglycerides, they have a glycerol backbone, fatty acids, all from the glycerol. Proteins, peptides, amino acids, and so on. Nucleic acids, which are RNA and DNA. <clears throat> High energy compounds, which are pretty much going to consist of ATP. These are all organic compounds. Clinical note here. And the, the clinical notes are good to look through as you're going through the, the actual book and slide sets. A lot of what this is based on and what this has to do with paramedicine is located in those clinical notes. And this one here, we were talking about proteins that were sensitive to temperature. Example of it is going to be mannitol. Now, to give you the Barney version of it now versus later, mannitol is a large sugar molecule and a large protein molecule. Now, the reason that's important the bigger this molecule is and then they're added together the heavier it is the heavier a substance is the more fluid it pulls towards it now the reason that that's important is is you use mannitol to decrease intracranial pressure you do this by putting mannitol into the system and what it will do is it will pull all of the fluid out of intercellular tissues so it will dehydrate them so if you're having a closed brain injury and you're dehydrating the cells up there, pretty much does it make sense that the dehydration of those cells is going to shrink 
the brain tissue and decrease intracranial pressure. Succinylcholine is another one. This is a type of paralytic, a depolarizing. It has a ton of contraindications that we'll have to remember at some point. And then obviously gases. Galluses can even be volatile. Before modern uh, anesthesiology, they used to still pull, put people out for surgery by the use of uh, ether. All right. So if there's any questions about this chapter, this is chapter two. Please feel free to contact me. Name is Roy Smith. Uh, number is 405-219-7613. And I can be easily reached at smithr at Thank you.